Hi, I'm Dinesh. Uh, so uh, actually I work at Gojek. Uh, we are sort of like a transportation fleet uh, with Paytm, all those things in Indonesia. So uh, in our company we have different uh, uh, services, like each for its own purpose. And uh, we've been written, uh, writing Golang code for services which takes really a uh, huge load. And also uh, we were initially using uh, Java and then later uh, Ruby and then finally we see most of the things we can we could have accomplished with Golang but all, always there is cases where like we could use closure and there are some cases where we have to use different things so uh, yeah so if there is anything catch up like catch up with me uh, that's about me so today I'll talk about uh, embedding in Go uh, so any questions please stop me and uh, it's gonna be uh, live code if you can't see it you guys can come up front so, uh, how many of you are new to Go? Just data collections, like first time. And who's using Golang in production? Cool, nice. Very rich, uh, drastic difference. <laughs> okay, so if that, since that is the case, uh, one question. In Java, even here, he was talking like previous talk, uh, speakers were talking about like inheritance, and Go doesn't support inheritance. And we always know that. Uh, the theory or even design patterns that prefer composition over inheritance. Uh, do you guys agree or like if you have thoughts like why why not just anybody? The inheritance is complicated. You have to always <laughs> figure out which function is going to get called from base classes, right? You do okay. composition. You're just saying that my object, this new object, is com com uh, combination of these set of. Um, you have ideas, you can go to uh, the base class and then when you build something, you always know extend something something. So which means you will be knowing the function, right? Right, but you have to be careful there, right? Sure, okay. Uh, okay, I agree the point has something to do with complexity. Any other points? So he's saying it's clearly separate. So I mainly have seen two points. One, we basically screw the inheritance. Like people use it in a very extensive way and it is complex in that way. It's not because of the way inheritance is built, but rather the way you, we use it. Uh, we just want to randomly reuse some function. That way people, what we do is we put a base, base trust and then we write method. And then we inherit from that. And then let's say there is another feature which we want to reuse. Actually, these two features are very different, but still, just because you want to reuse, you will end up putting in the same class. So it actually bloats the code, and also that way it becomes complicated. And second thing is, I uh, wonder, like nobody mentioned testing. So when you want to test, you basically want to mock the other things. And the way inheritance works in other languages, you have a protected method or some method, and then you will be overriding that method. But in test, if you want to just ignore it, uh, anybody have done that, like testing, excluding that piece of code? Anyone? So if, if it is simple, you tend to use it, but let's say if the base class contains some external service call or some very complicated op uh, operation which takes really long time, then you will have to mock it. Uh, but ideally all testing we use JNUIT. JNUIT doesn't support protected method uh, uh, mocking. But we tend to use something, there is something called power mock -ito, where you can mock the things, but it is really complex. So imagine also when you construct an object, and then when you do a new constructor inside it, you really cannot mock it. But just because Golang have uh, composed things, though you have 10 features, you end up building 10 different interfaces, and then you put things. Actually, uh, I think uh, Rob Pike, the, the uh, proverbs have saying, like interfaces keep it very simple. In fact, there is one-liner interfaces. So that is also there. So, embedding is, uh, we compo I mean it is a composition, which means you actually want to use some code which other struct has, 
and then you are basically putting that code in, into this particular struct. So you are basically embedding a different struct into the struct. So you want to use. Uh, hope I made some sense, like clear, all with me. So. So, uh, but there is one tweak I'll tell. Uh, um, where is it? Let's say, let's go to this place. Like, is it visible? If not, like, please come, fine. So, let's say, uh, the point I'm trying to make is, you have a struct. When we say composing, uh, even in Java, you can have, the, have it as a field, and then in constructor, you can inject the new instance. Basically, what I'm saying is, uh, you will have something like new object, and then you will be having like, uh, uh, in here, like dependent, and then this is some object, and uh, this is what you will be doing, right? So this particular object will be having that particular uh, other dependent, right? But the problem is, let's say this other dependent had 10 methods, right? And then if you want to overwrite 10 methods, or call 10 methods, like it's basically calling this particular thing. And uh, I don't know whether you guys have faced it, when you want to override uh, or like, how do you put it? When there is 10 methods, you want to just implement one method, you still have to define all the other things as abstract, whether you use it or not. That is really a painful thing. But in Go, instead of having it as a field, what we are saying is, you don't need to say it is, I mean, it is as a field, but still you embed it. So which means all the features which is inside that embedded object comes to the outside thing. So, what I'm saying here is, I have a gopher, all it has is a name, and it has a function called code. It, the gopher can code. And there is a dancer which embeds the gopher. Uh, leave the pointer for now, but you don't see any value here, right? Like this is gopher. This is also valid. This is what is compo composition. But when I say embedding, you don't give the uh, inside member actually a name, but rather it is an anonymous member. So then I have a method here, dance. So when I have a, uh, like I have some function, like I build a gopher, I build a dancer which ha takes that gopher. So dan dancer basically contains gopher. So now I can say g.code. Uh, now I can also say dancer.dance and I can also say dancer.code. If you would have done something like, uh, uh, let's say this gopher code, I don't, I want to ca also call here, right? Uh, if you would have done like gopher and then gpr.code, you will end up calling this. Uh, but if you don't give it as a name, then this is directly available on the outside. And if you want to really use it, right, you can still use it. It's like something like d.gopher.code. So this is basically for composition and uh, this is basically for embedding. So this uh, when you want to really use it, uh, you need to explicitly say the actual name, whatever the name is, it will be available as for usage. And when you don't really care about it, you can just do this, d.code and works. Like, I made some sense. So this is the basic thing. Uh, I have one use case and then uh, we can see the code for it. Uh, before that, I'll just run this and see what happens. Yes. It is same, it is same, it is same, but there are cases where you don't care about it, but there are cases where I need to use the topic. So, uh, it, it depends on the uh, usage. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Especially if there are different types of objects that have the same function. So, it's like, go for a score and say ABC, or the score, and when you embed it, like, how do you distinguish what object score you are moving? Uh, so it has a scope uh, resolution. If you don't have the method in the outside object, right? Here we saw gopher and the uh, embedding one like gopher inside dancer. If you want, if you call code, if the dancer doesn't have code, it goes to the gopher. Like it goes into the embedded objects and searches for it. And then if the outside has it, it actually calls that. And if it uh, crashes, like 
I mean, if it clashes, it also tells. Like there is a co co proper resolution order for it. So the ambiguity is not a problem. No, no. So you can you can make a call by uh, calling it uh, from the embedded objects name dot. Yes. 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 Uh, one point to the your question is uh, we might prefer compression. I mean, we still do compression. If the object are same, basically we will embed. I'm writing a. a uh, gopher. I'm writing a fat gopher. I will embed the gopher inside. But rather, I'm writing a gopher, but I'm writing something very irrelevant. That time, I will compose the other object. So, the feature is available. If you want to delete, if you delete the delegation kind of thing, you will actually do a composition. Correct. Otherwise, if you say it is the same, just uh, like made of uh, different parts, yes. then you will go with embedding. If it is same types, like similar types, we tend to embed it. So, I'll just. The expectation is that uh, that will be a name. Correct. You, you got the point right, very nice point. So, so it have to be some struct and it should have some name. Then only you can call that. So I was saying, uh, let's go to gopher. Uh, so here, if we have a gopher, this has a name. So when I want to call something, I can do uh, d.gopher.code if I want to explicitly call it. But let's say what he is saying is if it is map of something of I mean something of string, then how do we call it? You can't really have it right. Like I mean it should be a type in order for embedding it. So that was the point. This is primitive, so and it won't be possible. Type, right? Name types. <coughs> ah, name types. Yes. What's the difference? Like it's like a primitive something I can say. I mean string is a type, but it's a primitive type. But others are like structs. Like classes and in float, sure. that sort of thing. So that way you will not be able to differentiate it, right? So that was the point. Okay, so I'll just run it and then we'll go to the actual one. Um, okay, so I had a base gopher, it can code, and the gopher dancer, it can dance and also can code. So which means you basically inherited the feature. Um, one more point is. Uh, the embedding can be either of a pointer type or it can be of a base type. So here I have actually done a pointer type. Uh, any uh, guesses like or any random guess like what, when we use pointer and when we use applying embedding types? It's okay if it's wrong. Like it's just that I don't want to plug it. Can you add Uh, defaults for that particular uh, embedded object, then you tend to keep it as a pointer. Okay, cool. Then other points. Uh, sorry, didn't get So, JSON, another thing, you have a struct tag, right? Where you can define what the JSON is not sent and all that stuff. You can have a bit empty and all that stuff. Basically, what he is saying is having tags in the struct fields, but I don't know whether that decides the pointer. Uh, he actually had a valid point. Like when it's a pointer, you can change the struct's values. If it is not a pointer, you are basically changing the value. Like pointer, you can change the actual value of that particular type. If not, you can't change it. Uh, that is the one main reason uh, will be. And if the type itself is has feature on the pointer, then you have to use a pointer. So what I'm saying is, uh, gopher has a code. Here you can call uh, d dot gopher co dot code. Can you like when I call this, what will happen? Or to make it much more clear, I have a g gopher, and then I have a d dot g dot code. And when I call this, will this pass or fail? fail? So it is undefined because I actually have a pointer to it. So I'll just change this. Sorry. I need to initialize based on the uh, value also. So I'll, I'll I can change it, but I have a real other code which I, have, I want to show. So I'll explain here. Basically, you get it right. Like when I call that. 
particular method on that embedded thing, it needs to have that function on that, whether it is a pointer or struct. So if it is a pointer, I can call code only on the, on the pointer to the gopher, not on the plain text. So that was the point I had. So any use cases for, uh, um, uh, I mean, in, in like who are used in prod, like have you guys used embedding and like have you used it for some purpose, just use case? Yeah, so you construct like complicated JSON embedding. So what, what, what you mentioned, right? So construct types of JSON and Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know whether it. You talked about embedding interfaces and interfaces. This is interface into interface. We have a. So we can do that. So we have a single interface. interface which you want, uh, which is common to all the interfaces, and you want uh, your final struct implementation to be satisfied. Yes, yes. So the use case I have also implemented and like is also similar. I wanted a use case where like I don't know whether you guys use Rails. When you call any API on Rails, it basically logs the URL, its status, and its error code, everything. But now, let's say I have a Golang service, and I want to log each URL and its status code. Uh, can you do it? Like, can you do it? Exactly, exactly. So the reason why we need a decorator, I'll clarify for others, is uh, we have a HTTP uh, Response writer, and this has only methods which is header headers to set the headers, and uh, write is writing the body, and write header is basically setting the status code. But I don't see anything to get the status code, right? So you can't really have the functionality with the default uh, uh, response writer. But rather, we will end up building. I mean, we ended up building a, a decorator one. Like that's a very minor use case I'm giving. So we ended up building a, another decorator uh, which used this inside it, and then we uh, also save it, and then we log it whenever we want it. So I'll I'll take you through that. Uh, before that, I'll just give one more context, and then uh, we can directly go. Um, everybody is uh, familiar with this uh, contract, right? So, HTTP response writer and then another one is a pointer to HTTP request. So, this is basically a, a, a HTTP handler, which means any request, this particular can, handler can process it. So, what I'm doing now is uh, I have a ping, ping handler. All it does is, uh, when, you, when you make a request to slash ping, it does a pong, okay? And uh, I have a something called middleware. Middleware is basically, uh, you have some functionality, but you don't want that to uh, pollute the actual code base. So the previous one he was actually showing had authenticators inside the actual service. So you will actually have something like, uh, in the ping handler, first thing I'll be doing is pass it, and then service.authenticate, and then later actual business logic. But let's say you want to use something, but I don't care whether it is used or not in the actual code. So what I'm saying is authentication is really separate than the actual business code. So which means I can have multiple middlewares uh, composed and then the first middleware can authenticate and the second middleware like will not even know about it. So so if it was a service, right, I will I would have end up having like this as a closure, like su some service and then service.authenticate, right, with uh, params, something like that. It would have been like this. But since it is a middleware, I don't really need to uh, worry about it. So I'll show the authenticator here. So if you notice, ping is response writer, uh, others to uh, our HTTP request, pointer to request, it's a handler. And authenticator is also similar, like I'm composing it. Uh, this is a handler, I'm returning auth handler. What it does is, it takes a header. If the value is gopher, uh, you actually call the next one. If not, you don't call it. Make sense? So I'll just 
show it to you. Um, ha. Huh. And how I built, right? Like, if I would have just said ping, it will just do the ping operation. Now, if I want to add authentication to that particular handler, all I need to do is authenticator pass the next handler to it. So simple. So we'll just run this. So let's do not pass headers. It's unauthorized. And I'm passing the gophers. It's actually gopher. Now it's pong. So hope you got the point right. Like we get the header, we get the value. If it is gopher, uh, you don't send it to the next guy. If it is uh, passing, like here actually you meet all the preconditions, right? Then you actually call it. Then you are uh, you actually can reuse the middleware, but also. Uh, your actual business logic is unaffected by the other uh, different logics. So given this, uh, what we'll do is, we will try to write a, a custom response writer. I said, right? So I'll just do printing here. So form.printf uh, called, let's say, some URL. This is the URL which we are calling and we need status code. We still don't know about it, okay? And uh, the URL is our your requested URL dot path, okay? So let's just build it and see. Ha! Huh. So actually, you can see the logs. So now this is what 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 we want for each request. You need to log the URL and I need to log the status code. Uh, I mean, I said it is a use case, but you all guys understand why it is required, right? So for the other folks, basically you will have a, I mean, in any production environment, if you want to instrument, when I say instrument monitoring, it, um, I have a very, uh, how, how do you put it? Something like uh, I have a service uh, which makes a booking. I, I don't want that to fail ever. And then if you want alert based on it, what you need to do is, if the error code, if there is an error, you basically log it. So in your dashboard, what you can see is uh, thousand requests have been made today. Like thousand requests have been made to pen. Out of that, two hundred was a failure. So it is actually used in all the enterprise applications. Like anything, we tend to monitor. It is really valuable. So that is a use case. So now let's implement it. So I have a custom response writer. Let's write it. Uh, type custom custom response writer. It's a struct. What should I keep inside? What should I embed here? Yes. So let's embed the HTTP response writer. So I have a HTTP response right inside it. Note this point, it's actually an interface, it's not a structure or something. So you can actually embed an interface. And this can really take whether it can be a pointer or it can be a value. So interface can take both. It's just a point like you guys can try out later and then figure out. So now what we want is uh, how, do you, how, how can you uh, save the state? Like guesses, all I have is these three methods. Uh, I can't change Exactly. Correct. Correct. So we are basically going to overwrite, not overwrite, we're going to decorate the right header method. So this is the method uh, which sends a HTTP response. This is what we are interested in. Um, so we'll just write, it's a function on custom response writer. Uh, we'll just call it response writer and then write header. And then it takes a status, which is basically an end. And then let's look at the, I forgot the response. So response is nothing. So that's it. So now I actually want to save the state. What I'm going to do is add a something called status code. This is basically end. So now I'm going to use the response writer, but whenever somebody writes to it, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, uh, this response is this status. Okay, cool. Is this sufficient? Correct, correct. So now, now is the point, right? Like now, if I would have composed, I would have said something like blah and then right header. But now, since it's embedded, it is di directly available. If you are calling something else, right? Like uh, if you are calling right body, then I could have just done cw dot right. But I can't call cw dot right header because actually we have called it. Then it will be a, a infinite loop. So what we're gonna do is call it with an anonymous name itself. Okay, so fine, all good. Uh, one more point, but it's okay. We'll we'll see whether you guys catch it. Um, now we need to uh, we need to use a custom response writer somewhere, right? So we'll go here in authenticator, and then instead of passing a default writer, what we'll do we'll actually build custom response writer, which actually have has a response writer. This is a thing, and then I need to pass that here. You got like makes sense, right? You need to pass the decorated object rather than the default one. So now let's see uh, whether it passes. Um, and define custom response writer. Custom. I basically did a spell mistake somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that's it. Hopefully, it should pass. Yes. Uh, let's do it this way so that you can see. What? Huh, we'll print it. Oh, yes. Like, yes, we'll print it. So, I'm going to the authentic. I mean, ideally, I would have had a different middleware to do it. This does not belong to authenticator itself. For time being, I'm doing it. So, now the status code is percentage D. Uh, if it's visible, I'll. And uh, custom response writer dot status code. Yes, yes. Okay, all good. Hopefully, it should work. I'm saying. Cool. So let's see whether it passes. Will it work? Okay, let's see. Uh, huh, one more thing we missed. Uh, by default, the handlers, if you don't write any header, it's actually status 200. So we are not even calling it. So let's just write it. Uh, sorry, not write. Uh, uh, write header HTTP dot status. Okay, something like this. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It will write. We are not returning it, right? So that is called. Uh, but we still see status code 0. Guesses? Yes. 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 So we actually, like others got it right, like whoever knew. Now actually, though we are actually saving the value, you, are, you have a reference to the other one, but here it is a value. So what we have to do is, uh, this should be a pointer. If not, you can't change the value. And since we change the value, uh, huh, now let's run it. Will it pass now? Will it even compile? It won't compile. The reason being, the right header, uh, we are actually passing the custom response writer to HTTP response writer. So what I'm saying here is uh, this ping, this ping expects a HTTP response writer. The HTTP response writer uh, contract is basically three things, which is header, write, right header. Though we have a right header, we are not using a pointer, which means we have a plain reference to the custom re response writer. So this, this uh, in main, uh, not in main, this authentic authenticator, this doesn't really have that feature. So what we'll do is, instead of passing this, we'll actually pass a pointer, and then it should compile. Cool. So now let's run it. Hopefully it should work. Yes. Works, makes sense. So now, I mean, you can you could have written a different middleware, and then if it is unauthorized, right? Like, uh, let's say I'm doing here, 
and then um, let's also write this right huh instead of this I'm gonna write CRW and then I'm gonna write CRW so it is basically the same thing it has a response writer now I'm writing the base class itself so now we'll be able to see 404s also so this is something um, this is unauthorized because uh, it is not even coming here right so it didn't even come here but if it would have been a different handler we could have seen this uh, I don't think we can change it since it's the same class but makes sense right makes sense so yes uh, I'm, I'm done like I kept it simple so that's what I wanted to tell um, so we saw mid, uh, middlewares middleware are something like you want to reuse some code which is except the actual handler code you put it as a middleware what we did is uh, we had a, a response writer we decorated the response writer to be a custom response writer to embed the response writer and we actually decorated the uh, write header which is basically writing status code and in the end of the all the processing your service URLs uh, we ended up printing the status codes so this was the use case we discussed but overall embedding uh, we can do it in interface we can also embed a pointer to struct a pointer we can also embed a struct and uh, prefer a pointer only when the value is changed if not you will end up having a, prop, a normal types and like make sure that whether uh, whatever you are passing have the functionality if it is a pointer pass a pointer if it is normal struct pass a normal struct um, and on testing case right testing if I want to uh, write a uh, test for custom response writer I don't really need to uh, use a response writer but rather I can use a HTTP response writer mock and then which has a, a stub dependence so that is also possible so we were able to do achieve what we wanted to do which is reusable code and second thing we are able to test it and third thing is uh, it is still simple like nothing changed uh, I don't I didn't actually do anything with write or nothing like it is very simple what I wanted we could do it and uh, you could see this in a lot of places so io.reader uh, actually io.read uh, read closer so if you see this is a reader this is a closer Th this does nothing like all it does is it uses reader and it uses a closer it come uh, embedded to the two things and all we got was a nice interface and if there are, there are a lot of things places uh, example io util dot knob closer so this is also same thing but instead it does a read, a read part but it doesn't do a close part so it's nice in a way that since we have interfaces very smaller we could uh, actually overwrite what we really want uh, so that's all I had uh, if you have any questions shoot me